morning, everyone. Can we find our seats, please? To introduce myself, Steve Nash, director of the Nash Sculpture Center, and again, welcome to part two of our international conference on variable states in modern sculpture. Great to see everyone here. Appreciate the, the turnout, and I uh, think we have a pretty exciting uh, and a somewhat adventuresome day ahead of us. Uh, we are, as we discussed last night, going to be trying some things that have not been done before in any symposia that we are aware of, um, going where no art historian has go gone before. Uh, there may be a few glitches. We've rehearsed. We've done as much background preparation as possible. If, if we break down momentarily along the way why this is, goes with the territory, give us a little bit of um, patience and we'll be back on, back on track. But it, but it is, I think, a, um, a kind of a breakthrough format and, and should work um, even better given the registration of what you're going to be able to see on this screen than being in a crowded gallery and not being able to, to see things. Just to give a very brief overview of what the day's schedule is going to hold, uh, we are going to start with a couple of papers by Penelope Curtis and Derek Pullen, which will give us an overview of the general issues involved in the symposium, one from a curatorial point of view and the other from a conservator's point of view. And that will lead into the uh, gallery discussions. Uh, we will then um, begin to organize our, our teams in the gallery, and the first one will be for the Rodan discussion. That will take place over about a half an hour or so, and that's where we will be televising the proceedings from the gallery here into the, into the auditorium. After the session in the gallery, the participants, the panelists, will come back into the auditorium to answer any burning questions you may have of, on what has transpired in that particular um, half hour. And then after that, before lunch, we have a, a new introduction to the schedule, which we think you're going to be quite, quite interested in. This is very rapidly breaking news, in, in fact. Uh, we have been working here over the last few months only with a, a digital scanning technique for scanning sculptures, which has come to us out of industrial practice. And uh, there's a group in town that has come to the museum here and proposed using it on the scanning of uh, modern sculpture. And it really is quite phenomenal. It, um, with a, a laser, the a sculpture is scanned. It's all captured in a computer. The uh, images are put together within a computer, so you get an entire rendering of the sculpture, which can be looked at from any different point of view. But uh, most importantly, measures that sculpture down to many micron levels, so you have precise measurements of it. And what you will see is you can then take those images and with a lot of uses, I mean, for number one, archivally, you have that image stored forever and you can use that as a baseline against to compare um, any damage that might have occurred or any suspicion of damage or whatever to your particular piece. But uh, very germane to the discussion about the Rodans in this, in this exhibition about how different they are from one another, you can take the image and actually overlay them. And, and put them right on top of one another and measure graphically uh, and mathematically the differences between those casts. So we're going to demonstrate how this is possible. It's just really in its early stages of art application, but I think it has uh, amazing long-range usage, especially in conservation, but uh, in museum record keeping and website uh, usage, et cetera, et cetera. So that uh, will then conclude the morning session. We'll break for lunch come back about uh, 2 o'clock into the, into the auditorium, proceed with uh, two more of our gallery discussions, the second one being the Bust of Diego by Giacometti, and the third one being the Jeff Kuhn sculpture of Louis XIV. Uh, at that point, all the panelists will be in here on the stage, and we will have a, a big roundtable discussion with, with everyone. And we really count on and invite uh, audience participation we really want to uh, have it as open and free-flowing and no-holds-barred uh, exchange as, as possible. So we look forward to that. I'll be um, moderating that and you know, trying to keep it moving along. But it's uh, very 
potentially has uh, some of the, the, the most interesting um, uh, uses for us as a way of wrapping up and getting further into some of these major issues. As I said last night, we do hope to condense, summarize the proceedings eventually into a publication, probably a website publication, and may take us a little while to do this, but we don't want the proceedings to just um, escape off into the ether. We really want to, to capture them and, and record them and make them available for reference and for others who couldn't, couldn't be here. And finally, after that, we will have a reception, this time with wine <laughs> <laughs> and food. <laughs> and hopefully uh, the weather will be cooperative and we may be even able to go outdoors. So uh, stay tuned for all the above. I want to welcome uh, to the podium first Penelope Curtis, who is, as you learned last night, director of the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds, has been um, in the curatorial life and sculpture for a long time at uh, the Tate, has been writing several important books on, on modern sculpture, and uh, in her position at Leeds, really has developed that program into, I, I think I can say, the the preeminent uh, sculpture study exhibition program in, in the world. They are very, very active with exhibitions and symposia and publications and uh, really do just a fantastic job. So uh, Penelope, glad to have you here. Thank you very much. I wish that were true, <laughs> but thank you. Right. Okay, the beginning of a long day. Modern sculpture is often thought of as, in some way, transgressive, a unique creative act. But in fact, much of what applies to sculpture traditionally, that is, its very ability to be reproduced, applies to modern sculpture too, and has been overlooked. Whereas it is standard practice to compare editions of Renaissance bronzes, who looks in any detail at the editions of modern sculpture, who indeed, other than the dealer or the auctioneer. Discussions of modern sculpture have focused much more on ideas than on the making, but in so doing have overlooked the way in which a traditional methodology like casting can carry meaning too. The conservators of contemporary sculpture have had to deal with all kinds of modern problems, including the treatment of unstable and transitory materials new to the sculptural corpus. But in fact, we all need to look back and focus on traditional problems if we are to fully to engage with the meaning of modern works like the ones on show here. Now, to try and get the slides. I've never encountered the slide system before. Sorry, you've got the screen, but not the buttons. Oh. Okay, thank you. Right. I'll just wait for the lights to go down. Right. So Derek Pullen, who is a conservator of modern sculpture at the Tate Gallery in London, and I are going to offer you two points of view, two personal ways of reading sculpture, which will inevitably reflect our different professional formations, and then we'll attempt to weave them together in a concluding discussion of a single work of art. We think we can show that curators and conservators are not so far apart in the way they deal with works. Though the emphasis may be different, we are both concerned with meaning and we intend to introduce our positions with an assessment of our first appraisal of a sculpture. In a preliminary discussion with Derek, he contrasted the long view of sculpture with the close-up examination. We don't want to adopt such contrasting roles, but we will play with these two approaches. The appraisal, taken at a distance, which embraces the standpoint of the viewer and the context of the sculpture, and close or even hands-on looking, which involves the inside and the underneath of the sculpture. This conference is entitled Variable States, and this title means something. So we intend to structure our individual readings by looking at these words, variable 
and states and assessing what they mean for us. I'll begin with variability and look at the means by which it is effected, the addition or the multiple. Paintings are singular. Sculptures were not and are still not necessarily. But we rarely view this multiplicity as a positive characteristic, but rather as something regrettable, which we may have to acknowledge but tend to prefer not to dwell on. Editions and the size of editions at best seem uninteresting, at worst positively embarrassing. Instead, we have a funny way of seeking originality or aura in sculpture, looking either for the first cast or the notionally original plaster, when in fact, as Derek pointed out to me, the last in a run of casts may be more successful because the detailed technical aspects have now been fully mastered. And indeed, our interest in originality has rather oddly been located at the beginning rather than at the end of the sculptural process. We try to find singularity in sculpture by looking for the first sketch in clay or the original clay model. And then we look for the lifetime cast hypothetically controlled by the artist. How many exhibitions have been devoted to sketch models and maquettes, and how few to comparing the end results? We are much happier with the idea of uniqueness than with reproduction, though this may be, may be a modern blind spot, which in fact ignores the way in which images have acquired their power. If we are first to acknowledge and then to explore the fact that additioning may involve meaning, then we can face up to one of the fundamental attributes of cast sculpture, along with the fact that we need to acknowledge that the motivation is, as often as not, primarily economic, as made, by, as made clear by the fact that even contemporary video sculpture is produced in small and carefully guarded editions. Discussions leading up to this symposium led to the exhibition that we have on show here today, which is in itself an unusual sequence, and an important chance to take stock of the multiple character of sculpture, and what this can tell us about an artist's intention. In our discussions, it seemed to me that the conservatorial half of our team took it as read that the artist's intention was their primary and guiding light. But to this, I think we have to add our, the viewer's interpretations. So, how do I read these sculptures in terms of why they were cast in a multiple edition? I think we might see Rodin as comparatively unconcerned with the various reproductions of his Age of Bronze. Many examples were cast in his lifetime, consecutively, but at irregular intervals, over time, according to demand, rather than together at the same time as part of an artistic exercise. Moreover, Rodin probably relied upon casting as a way of assuring a work's future while restricting its availability in the present. Perhaps, therefore, our own reading of the multiplicity of the Age of Bronze means as much, if not more, as that of the artist. This would seem quite unlike Giacometti, who, in his portraits of his brother, Diego, suddenly steps outside normal practice to finish his bronzes by painting them. One is tempted to read this as a highly personalized and familiar gesture for his brother. But we know that Alberto painted his bronzes on other occasions and seems to have used the multiple but similar surfaces offered to him in one bronze edition to extend and make good what canvases never could. That is, the continued possibility of choice and of temporary or coexistent multiple conclusions. For Jeff Koons, on the other hand, the potential of reproducibility and the possibility of exact reproduction is a one-off notion to be tried as its own objective. Jeff Koons' use of the reproduction is, of course, very different to that of Rodin. By the 1980s, multiple casting was no longer the norm within the practice of sculpture. Kuhn's made his metal editions precisely to test the possibility of eliminating variation. Giacometti, on the other hand, 
used casting and additioning so as to essay difference, not sameness. While Rodin, thirdly, may well not have been interested in either sameness or difference, he used casting for a functional reason, to disseminate his work in the world and among those who wished to acquire it. The theory behind casting is to make more than one copy available in the same way. Kuhn's test the truth of this theory in his Louis XIV. Is real similitude possible? Do we feel more or less comfortable with Kuhn's attempt to use casting for what it is, or what it is meant to be, than with Giacometti's interest in pointing up difference, or with Rodin's apparent indifference to the means of reproduction and its potential significance? Rodin's work is a rather private early work which became public because of the controversy it caused. It came to advertise Rodin and the struggle of genius, and collectors wanted it as such. A much reproduced work, which nevertheless spoke of authenticity and determination, the Age of Bronze was rather like the calling card of the artist. Giacometti's work is a family portrait. Do we see it as a private gesture or as part of his persona as an artist? Diego's image had to be uncovered by his portraitist, whereas Louis XIV was an image already captured, whether or not it was Louis XIV himself. Giacometti's Diego looks as if, might, as if it might slip away from us while Louis XIV sits there as proud and as shining as a soup tureen. Kuhn's use of Louis XIV as his subject is not unimportant. The Sun King was as interested in his image as, in, as Kuhn's was, and his reign much associated with narcissism and, of course, with absolutism. Royal busts would originally have been widely reproduced at the behest of the ruler. Now they are multiple because the artist wishes them to be so. The fact that casting can lead us to evaluate, at the same time, the notions of sameness and difference means that it leads us to explore the meaning of sculpture itself. Sculpture has long been a multiple art, and its multiplicity has been subject to abuse as much as to invention. We judge in gross, and we judge in detail. Multiplicity can be used well, creatively, but it can also be used in ways which appall those who have had the fortune of seeing the so-called original. Some sculptors are subject to, or, the en or are the engines of abuse during their lifetimes, others only posthumously. Rodin was discreet, if not secretive, about his work's reproduction, and this led to a shock at his death, in which the values of his sculpture were questioned, and this gave rise ultimately to a project such as that by Kuhn's, or those by Alan McCollum or Sherry Levine, in which the reproduction of sculpture is the subject of sculpture. On the one hand, stainless steel gives the impression of silver and of luxury. On the other, of the perfection of the production line. This exhibition gives us a unique chance to consider the perfectibility of reproduction and to consider the passage of time as played out on nominally similar objects and to ask whether time enhances or warps variability and our ability to read the artist's intention. This brings me to the second of our key words, states. Adam Gopnik was saying yesterday that you'd rarely see photographs with people in them, real people. So here's one. The idea of states of sculpture can be taken in a technical sense, a given stage on the road to reproduction, or in a more realistic sense, the different states which affect a sculpture's look and our reading of it. And to a large extent, these states are connected with time and space. We think of sculpture as rather permanent, as rather durable. Conservators will tell you that they are anything but. The changes which sculptures forego may happen at the time they are made, because the artist wishes them, or because a client demands them, or much later, 
because of the conditions under which they have changed. Changes can be absolutely deliberate or very much accident accidental. Understanding how best to restore the original surface and how best to deal with the sculpture's contemporary conditions are not necessarily compatible. Artists' intentions may be documented, but they may still be open to question. Tapes, photographs and words are as open to investigation as the sculpture itself. Giacometti's portrait, painted bronze, is somewhere between painting and sculpture and an excellent synthesis of his two practices. Its features struggle to cohere. Its painted surface gives it an endless impermanence, a refusal to settle, which contrasts and contradicts the very stability of Kuhn's. As so often with later Giacometti, the material is cast as provisional and even unsatisfactory. His broken and multiple surfaces refuse the skin of sculpture and its containing profile. Giacometti's paint makes his bronze wet, clay-like, close to his touch, close to the effort and not the result. However, Kuhn's speaks of iconicity and of pictorialism, the graphic and defined image, rather than of the process of attempting to define and grasp the image. The surface of Kuhn's rejects not only our eyes and our questions, but it almost succeeds in rejecting time itself. It seems to deny the aging process. So this is how I want to understand Giacometti and Kuhn's, their use of casting, of editioning, and of these works. This is how I make sense of this nexus. We have to take account, and we have to listen to our own interpretation, and think about how we understand a sculpture. A sculpture's history is often communal, and alongside an artist's intentions, I think we need to deal with our own intentions and also with dealers' and museums' intentions. A professional conservator can link sculptures to a given institution, rather like children to a family, because they show the way they have been looked after. Indeed, their histories of care make a very ready link to the notion of institutionalised childcare. You can tell who's been looking after these sculptures, and you can tell whether they've had good or bad parents. Besides which, what about accepting changing meaning and changing circumstance and unplanned results? We may find more beautiful, more meaningful, more poignant artworks which have survived to speak to us in what must be very different ways than their authors intended. As authors, as historians, as viewers, we can appreciate the hand of history in the figures from Romanesque cathedrals. For example, or figures from Greece and Rome. And indeed, Rodin was very affected by the effects which time had wrought on the sculptures on the cathedrals of Chartres and Rennes, and of the Greek and Roman pieces that he himself collected. Time moves at different speeds across the surfaces of sculptures. After only 40 years, Eva Hesse's latex sculptures are almost irretrievably aged. But bronze, however, has traditionally lasted well. Outdoor sculptures raise questions of restoration most quickly. And it is relevant to ask whether Rodin himself could have accepted the effects of only 100 years of weather and time as visible in the Leeds Age of Bronze, which you see on the left when it was outdoors. Sculpture is seen as something rather solid. We know it changes with time, use and touch. This much is well known, but we tend not to associate this continual state of evolution with surface. We tend to associate sculpture with solid state rather than with its evanescent changing surface. Yet with these three sculptures, chosen because they are cast, all from metal, the choices are associated with their surface the top layer of the more or less constant substructure. The surface of a sculpture is an arena of choice for
for some sculptors and not for others, but it is always an area involving choice for the conservator. So we're looking here at something rather like a painter's finish, and the choices which are bound up with surface are our subject today. We're not looking so much at form or at subject as at how these matters are also expressed in their finish. So we're looking at that fine and fleeting couche or layer, that area in which the artist makes a final and determining choice or series of choices, and most pertinently for today perhaps, that area in which a contemporary conservator has to exercise special judgment. Surfaces vanish, break up and discolour, and it is here on this skin-thin domain that intentions can be lost, rediscovered and remade. This is, in the phrase coined by, by Jim Coddington, who was part of our advisory group during our discussions, this is the discretionary surface. This, in an important sense, comes from the conservator's point of view. But the conservator's discretion is enacted according to what he or she judges, judges to be the artist's choice. It is a surface which embodies possibility. It has no one way of being, and it is up to us to adjudge how it might best be now. Today, we have the unique possibility of looking at and comparing the same works with different afterlives. And this is a vast admission of the multiple character of sculpture. A fundamental but frequently sectioned aspect of the art. Now we can focus on sameness and difference, on the works which have led different lives and whose appearances, for better or worse, have been chosen for them according to different curatorial and conservatorial decisions. So, if we look at casting as a way of effecting difference as much as sameness, we are perhaps closer to the heart of the problem. And this is a problem which should affect art historian and conservator alike. To what extent should we embrace difference within an edition? To what extent was it the artist's intention to make change? To what extent is it our wish to present difference? And to what extent should we restore sameness? Thank you. Thank you, Penelope, and welcome, everyone. Um, we'll just take a moment or two to set up the PowerPoint and make sure everything's working. Okay, is the sound all right? Is no echoing? coming? Good. Um, let's begin. When Penelope and I were discussing how we should present this part of the symposium, she suggested that it was an opportunity to present my own credo. Well, credo or creed would be far too grand a title for it, but something said by David Sylvester, the writer on art and maker of exhibitions, has been important to me for a long time. He said something to the effect that, looking at detail risks missing the overall picture, but not looking at detail is not looking at all. I often recall Sylvester's remark, both as a reminder to take a step back and as justification for what, as a conservator, I enjoy doing most, that is, exploring sculpture through their details. While we've many aids to assist looking at sculptures, perhaps the most useful is a willingness to empathize both with the object and its maker. I do believe that you can only do this by trying to read the sculpture maker's decisions right down to the fine detail. 
Today, we have an opportunity to go further than just looking and to benefit from the insights of a range of experts to explore why sculptures look as they do and what meaning their similarities and differences carry for us. Like Penelope, I'll be suggesting questions to stimulate debate. For example, the Coons bust of Louis XIV stand here like identical twins, which even their adoptive parents, the owners, can't be sure of which is which. Would it matter if the wrong one was sent back? <laughs> <sighs> I sort of know it would, but, but why? <laughs> Is the, uh, is the interesting question here, and I think Adam, Adam addressed this a little last night. So we decided to examine the title, Variable States. The phrase describes what, as a conservator, I understand to be the nature of things. In the material world, the world of materials, constant states don't exist. All materials are liable to change, but the rate of change is itself variable. It can be speeded up or slowed down by how we decide to treat the material. It's no surprise, for example, that outdoor bronzes corrode faster than indoor ones. Variable can also mean adjustable. So there is choice. We can often slow down the rate of change but only if that's the right thing to do. First, we have to characterize the condition of an object, its state. Establish what we're dealing with and then determine its potential for change and the significance of that change. For example, a, a rusting armature in a plaster threatens to burst the plaster as it expands. It has to be dealt with, but a corroding outdoor bronze may be intended to turn green or not. It's the condition may be consistent with long outdoor that the condition which may be consistent with long outdoor exposure can mislead spectators into thinking the sculpture is meant to look weathered, or the aged appearance may help viewers to identify with a work, say from the 19th century. After all, we don't expect such works to be in perfect condition and it can indeed be very unnerving when such works are in perfect condition. These are judgments about variability, best worked out in the sort of discussions we'll be having here today. And the collaborative approach does happen outside this conference, but not perhaps as often as it should. As part of the characterization process, we can collect large amounts of technical detail about a sculpture. We can analyze the material, the alloy, the core, the surface coating. We can measure the dimensional and weight variations between one cast and another. Conservators thrive on, these, on identifying these different states. A simple technique, which is also the most prized privilege of, con privilege of conservators, is to handle the works, to touch, with gloves on of course, to feel as well as measure the weight, to look underneath and inside the bronze, and perhaps see whether it has been made by sand casting or lost wax technique, immediately we're let into a secret and feel more engaged with both the sculpture and the sculptor. In this context, bronze casting itself is almost a secret process. Each foundry does it slightly differently. Processes and foundry workers change and they rarely document what they do. There are still far too few descriptions of the making of sculpture that make it come alive, and still nothing at all to, to match Cellini's account of the casting of, the, of his Perseus in 16th century Florence, for conveying the excitement and the complexity of the casting process. So lacking good first-hand accounts of what happens in the foundries, we often have to rely on the information embedded in the object, summed up in the phrase, not written in words, but wrought by labor. Less hands-on are non-destructive technologies borrowed from medicine and engineering, such as x-rays and ultrasound scans, that need no samples or interference with the object. 
They show the hidden structure of sculptures that need interpretation. And we may see some more x-rays later today of the, both the Nasha and the National Gallery plaster. Put, these, put this information together with what we can learn with the naked eye, perhaps supplemented by ultraviolet or raking light examination. And you'll see today people using torches, to, rather like CSI, to examine pieces carefully. Um, we can start to formulate how a figure was made and perhaps for what purpose. Today, facing three groups of sculpture, we're largely without uh, technical data and we'll have to speculate and hypothesize. There will be evidence for what we can see and what others know, and a few may be allowed to touch, but mostly we shall have to rely on the insights of scholarship and people's experience of related sculptures. Penelope mentioned conservators' reliance on preserving the artist's intent as a guiding principle for our actions. Um, and let me stress here that we're, that's not the same as trying to keep objects in perfect original condition. Um, intent has become much more important as another guiding principle for conservation, reversibility, has been much more closely examined. So-called reversible treatments sometimes fail to recognize that change never stops, especially in outdoor situations. Reversibility is still an aspiration, but more and more we're looking to sustainable treatments that recognize that some change is unavoidable. We opt for actions that involve the minimum of actual interference with a sculpture and concentrate on achieving equilibrium with its environment. This might be a carefully balanced maintenance, maintenance program or a display case with low humidity microclimate to reduce corrosion. At stake are the subtle distinctions of surface color and texture where we might expect the sculptor to have had the final say. Sometimes this results in a conflict of purpose as in the case of Brancusi. The sculptor insisted some of his works should be highly polished and forbade the use of lacquer to preserve that polish. Polishing removes metal, of course, obscures inscriptions, and highlights the imperfections that exist in every cast bronze. Nowadays, we try, we try to interview sculptors and record their views on display, surface change, maintenance, and future restoration. We record details of when, where, and how, and why the sculptures were made, and their relationship to other works in the sculptor's oeuvre. Which changes in the future would matter, and which would not? What matters more to the artist, fingerprints on a polished bronze, or the absence of lacquer? Always we try to suggest solutions, but I'm strongly of the opinion that conservators should not seek to take the edge off contemporary works by making them too safe. Standing back a little has this additional meaning. One way of structuring the discussions that follow would be to ask, what would we want to know from Rodin and Giacometti if they were here now? After all, we can ask Coons if he still, if he really requires that his cast should be perfect replicas and remain so for, forever. It seems to me that when sculptors do articulate why they do something, they often give very practical reasons and are highly aware of limitations imposed by costs, space, and availability of materials. Unfortunately, there's nothing to stop them contradicting themselves next time they're interviewed. <laughs> if, however, the sculptor uses the sculpture rather than the words to express meaning, then we can confront the conservation problems they pose in a similarly tacit way. Sometimes the right thing to do is the one that feels right by the sculpture. I'm tempted to call this judgment artist's intent by proxy. A sculptor may indeed have no view about the future of the works, or their known likes and dislikes may be reinterpreted to suit various arguments. Henry Moore once rhapsodized over the streaky corrosion patterns on the horse's belly of, Marcus, of the Marcus Aurelius equestrian statue in Rome. They form a sort of contour map that hugs the bronze form, not unlike the lines in Moore's own drawings. But I've heard this taken as license to leave Moore's own bronzes to corrode, as he would have wished. In some cases, maybe, but not when one observes that 
Moore's later bronzes all left the foundry with a lacquer coating designed specifically to resist the corroding effects of outdoor display and preserve the inner and outer contrasts of his distinctive light and dark brown patterners. By the way, the Marcus Aurelius, um, which was taken indoors for conservation, is, is now kept indoors, and uh, a replica is in its place in the Campidoglio. For this reason, uh, let me get on. For this reason, Tate decided some years ago not to loan casts for outdoor display any longer. The Moore Foundation, the Henry Moore Foundation, has a collection of many casts from the same editions as Tate's. The foundation does lend to outdoor venues and despite good maintenance, has now and then to repatinate its bronzes. Most of Tate's Moors will remain as a sort of reference collection, displayed in much less harsh conditions indoors where we can confidently predict their slower rate of change. The Henry Moore Foundation and Tate's complementary display policies are only a temporary answer to a question closely linked to today's theme, how variable can variable states become? I've spoken a lot about outdoor bronzes because that inside versus outside decision is something we can all recognise as crucial to the rate at which sculptures will change. Cleaning and maintenance decisions are also key factors in the long-term appearance of outdoor, bronze, outdoor sculptures. Cleaning is one of the most easily misapplied conservation techniques, which can lead to large collections of bronzes acquiring a uniform oxidised finish that masks and possibly destroys variations that were present when first made. In central London, bronze statues were for many years after the Second World War government maintained they all acquired a uniform black patina due to the identical cleaning and oiling treatment applied to them without regard for the bronze's original appearance. Here today we can all participate in the evaluation of different and similar appearances and perhaps discuss how they've arisen. We'll need to go beyond the technical explanations and probe how we feel about these differences. This is the sort of standing back, looking hard, and feeling at a deliberately subjective level that I think is helpful to decision making and conservation. As an example, we have the Medardo Rosso exhibition that was held here earlier this year. For many decades before his death, Rosso's technique was described as modeling in wax over plaster. That's modeling in wax over plaster. But before I'd looked in detail at, uh, at any Rosso wax sculpture, it seemed to me odd that any artist would churn out essentially the same sculpture over and over again by so laborious technique. And indeed, when one looks at the detail, all Rosso sculptures show signs of casting, and there are no indications of original modelling. The waxes, the bronzes, the plasters, they're all cast. I think Rosser was very unusual in his interest in exploiting the potential of casting to yield similar but different sculptures, the variable states of our title here. Few sculptors think of additions as opportunities for experiments and variation, and I realise this is something we're going to have to discuss a bit more. <laughs> Does it defame their intentions to suggest that for the most part they aim to make an object and then move on? Here I'm suggesting that many variable states are accidentally varied or are, or are executed beyond the control of the artist. The Picasso Head of Fernand exhibition, also shown here earlier this year, showed that having made his clay model in a burst of creative intensity, Picasso had relatively little, one could almost say very little, interest in what happened afterwards as numerous bronze versions of it were cast over the next 50 years or so. Research started by Valerie Fletcher and Shelley Sturman continue, but it has been suggested that the earliest Fernand bronzes were less faithful to the form of the plasters than the later bronzes. In the latter, there is an improvement in exact replication that represents changes in foundry practices from sand casting to lost wax and from piece moulds to gelatin and silicon rubber moulds. What do we make of this? 
Do we value the authenticity of a rough bronze cast shortly after the sculpture was conceived in clay more than the exactitude of a much later cast? This hanging question leads on to my final suggestion for a, dis for a discussion today. Posthumous casts. There's a market for posthumous casts because they supply a demand for the almost real thing. The laws relating to copyright and taxation regulate this trade. It thus operates within legal limits and fulfills a useful function. And for example, we wouldn't have any Degas bronzes at all, nor quite so many Rodans. Nonetheless, what I, ref I view when I know a, a work is a posthumous cast makes me feel uncomfortable, no matter how right the form. And again, I think we're talking about feelings and things that Adam addressed last night. However, posthumous bad, lifetime good is just too easy a division. What of the lifetime bronzes? Perhaps heads of Fernand cast 50 years later, which the sculptor probably never saw. Indeed, how many sculptors do see every cast in an edition? Is the meaning of these disconnected casts so different from a posthumous cast or unauthorized copy? So Penelope and I have both peppered our presentations with unanswered questions as our con contribution to today's discussions. They illustrate the different interests and backgrounds we bring to looking at sculpture and the, and the overlaps. Let me finish with a thought that echoes both Adam Gopnik's and Penelope's presentations. They stressed how we must, <coughs> they stressed how we must have a relationship. <coughs> we forgot the word. They stressed how we must have a relationship with what sculptures have become, with what they mean to us as well as to the artist. I believe that examining sculptures in detail and looking for decisive decision points for evidence of artists' intent, often, I admit, with a slightly cynical viewpoint, I believe it does lead to a relationship with the object that enhances our ability to preserve its past and present meanings. Thank you. We're just going to finish with um, a final joint presentation in which we try and prove how we have talked to each other. <laughs> well, to be fair, I think this was actually almost the starting point of the conference when Penelope recalled um, at one of our steering committee meetings uh, how when she first showed me this um, bronze, well, these, by the way, are two slides. They come up a little early of... Um, We'll come back to those. We're just waiting for, should we wait for the can PowerPoint? We get, can we get back to the PowerPoint? Do I need to? And what we're going to show you is the Rodin Age of Bronze, which is in the collections in Leeds, where I work. And we acquired this 10 years ago. So at that, that time, 10 years ago, I sought Derek's advice, because Derek is the most well-known conservator of modern sculpture in Britain. And... Um, we had a discussion about this, and we didn't really agree. And then, <laughs> ten, years, 10 years later, this conference provided another opportunity for us to um, get together, and we thought this was a sensible work to come back to and look at it again together and discuss how our, how our points of view coincided or differed. And just to give you a little bit of history, this piece was commissioned from Rodin by the Beckett family in London, and... They ordered it in 1908. The first cast that arrived from Rodin in Paris, they didn't like, and they sent it back to Rodin. Unfortunately, although the letters in the Rodin Museum tell us that much, they don't tell us why they didn't like it. So anyway, it was sent back to Paris. Then a second version came back to London. They liked it, and they sent it to their Yorkshire estate and put it in the gardens. And it was outdoors in Yorkshire for 100 years. And then we bought it in 1994. And... I'm sorry, it's very poorly displayed in um, these photographs. It's a temporary position, but this is how Derek and I looked at it in the summer. And I think we still felt that 
we came at it really quite differently. Yes, I mean, originally, um, when Leeds first got the piece, you, disp you displayed it in the sort of glazed entrance porch in, in daylight, and it, um, and it certainly looked great there. But my first reaction on seeing this, this piece was, um, well, when are you going to restore it? Because here was a piece that uh, had been outside for 80 years, would it be? Nearly, nearly that, a century. Ne nearly a century, OK. And um, what I saw was, was a great example of outdoor weathering. Um, and I found it very difficult to get beyond that. Uh, and I was interested because this whole conference has sort of has loosened me up my, my view on, on this. But I, I, wondered, I wondered going back to Leeds to see it with, with uh, Penelope, whether I would just sort of cave in and say, no, you're right, leave, leave it alone. <laughs> but in, in fact, when I saw it again, I, I had had the same feeling. Um, and I do find the, uh, uh, the streaking, um, the corrosion, distracting. It's, it's safe, and I, I, I commend uh, Leeds. It's been well looked after there. No, no further harm is going to come to this piece if you do nothing at all. But we're, back, we're really back to, um, to two viewpoints. On the one hand, I think, Penelope, you, you see it as, as a, a, you kept saying, it's beautiful. And, and it is beautiful, but I love it and say, but it's corroded. And <laughs> one of the things we, I'd be interested in doing now, because we're, we're, I think we're running pretty well on time, okay. is, yeah. to, is to actually hear um, some things from the audience. I don't know if you may want to say a little bit as we, these slides run through. Yes. I mean, I think that um, what I learned from talking about this with Derek again was that one of the reasons that allowed me, I felt, as a responsible curator, not to have this piece fully restored was because there were so many other versions. And therefore I felt that, I mean, as we've, we can see here already, three different bronzes, and we know that there are probably 19 or 20 lifetime casts of this piece in different places. And even just in England, there are examples in Manchester, which is near Leeds, and in London. Um, so people can see how this piece looks and they can see it in a, in a, with a much more original and complete and cohesive and coherent patina. So I think I, I did find this corrosion quite beautiful. And I also thought that because there were so many other versions, that gave me some license to leave it as it was, to stabilize it, but to leave it as it was. And I think um, I felt that it's, it's a 100-year history outdoors in a garden in a Yorkshire country home was now part of its meaning. And I, su I suppose that's where we, um, we differed, because I think Derek, to a certain extent, could see that there was some beauty, but it was wrong. Um, and and it, this was damage, and he saw this as a, a damaged body, really, that needed to be restored. And you also felt, Derek, I think, that the corrosion meant that you read the sculpture wrongly, so that its highlights and um, darks and lights were incorrect. So I felt we, were, we began to look very much at the surface like a painter and that the colour balance was wrong on this painting. Yeah, yeah I think that's a good, that's a good summary. Um, I wonder if perhaps we could have some comments um, in the middle. Well, one question would be... How could, you, could you just say who you are for the audience when, yeah, when you... Yes, I mean, I think that um, already we've been looking at the Rodans next door and looking at the what we would like to see as the embrace of accident by Rodin, because we know what an inventive and experimental artist he was. But I, I think in this case, it, I felt I, it didn't seem such a hard decision because there were so many other examples. And therefore, I thought that it was that that allowed me not to make the difficult decision. Whereas I think if this had been a unique cast, I would have felt obliged, probably, to restore it to um, something more like an original patina. Hi, I'm uh, John Zerenoff from the uh, PMA, Philadelphia Museum of Art and Museum. Um, the one thing, I mean, to 
you go beyond what he said about Rodin in the book of Action, Rodin clearly knew that he wanted to achieve a certain kind of fair degree effect for his outdoor works. And in fact, in his patination, he specifies in letters to Limege whether or not he wanted to do an indoor work or an outdoor work. So he had patinas that were specifically meant to be left outside and aged. And so it's very different, I think, than the earlier thinker of ours that you showed, which was an extremely good example of why you do need to <laughs> reverse the corrosion process. But it, looking at artists' intentions and looking at the state of the work are two things that I think also need to be in a way carefully balanced in whether or not we can determine whether something is as he intended it or not is, of course, very difficult, but we can look at something and say, how far it has been removed from what he might have intended. Um, and that puts us on a, uh, a much more subjective than you said in your yeah. um, presentation. I think that's a very good point. It, it does put us on a subjective level. Thank you. Carol? Um, I'm Carol Mancusandaro from the Whitney Harbor. I'm, I'm perplexed by two issues that keep coming up. I, I, I think of what Adam said last night of close looking at objects is close looking at time. But then I hear what you're saying, Derek, and I think about if this were a painting, if this were not a coexistent multiple, as you say, chemology, but this were a painting, we would feel that this damage interfered with the image as we saw it, and we would feel the need to pull it together visually to preserve the artist's intent. So I'm wondering if we're really talking about artist's intent at all, mm. or what Adam was saying about our relation to it in terms yes. of time. Well, I think I mean, you put your finger on the difference between yeah. painting and sculpture. Can, and um, we've just noticed that you, we can't, people at the back can't hear questioners at the front, so we'll just, do you want to try summarising? You summarise it. <laughs> <laughs> I think what Ruth's point is, is a useful one and it does apply much more widely to Rodin, that, that you can pick out artists' comments about these works um, almost to suit whichever argument you want. <laughs> um, I certainly do. <laughs> um, I suppose the, the outdoor question is a very big one. And um, if it, one of the questions is, would we, do we, should we accept this work as an outdoor sculpture, or should we see it as an indoor sculpture? Should we restore it to an indoor state? Um, but I, I mean, to come back to what Carol was saying, I think that this is where painting and sculpture different are different. And if you if you have a big cast, a big addition, um, then you you want you're interested in seeing the difference between the different casts, aren't you? Whereas if you have a painting, you feel you must restore it to uh, something like what you feel it should have been originally. Yes. And so you would agree with Derek that its form is currently eroded and it should be... Well, it's actually interesting that you ask me that because Rodin is one place where I would probably feel really comfortable talking about this um, in this context. Uh, the thinker, of course, <coughs> was quite grotesque in his stripedness. This object is nowhere near no. that altered, and you've already said that. Mm. Yes. Um, but um, I would want to see 
this myself if I were just judging this one piece, even as good as your range of slides are, before I could evaluate, because this is in a much more ambiguous zone. And as my friend next to me said, well, maybe I'd mark out, get rid of a few stripes, but not redo the whole thing. So there you are. So <laughs> yeah. Since it was wax, get rid of a few of the worst things. Yeah, so, you, you're, in, so you're very much in this um, discretionary area. and. So do you, do you leave what you have, because this is its history, this is its 100 years history, or do you kind of take it back to some kind of unknown stage well, before it... Personally, I probably, without thinking about it a lot, without seeing the real piece, would, would because there are so many, leave it alone. The, the only problem, I've, having seen many f in preparation for this conference, I, I'm more comfortable with leaving it. But I'm very aware that the people of Leeds, mostly, this will be the, the first time they've seen this piece. And so I do think we have to sort of consider what they would make of it, not just what we well, would make of it. That's a very good point, and just not to over-personalize this, but the, since I'm giving you my totally subjective opinion, I also started out thinking I was going to be an archaeological conservator. So I'm actually much more conservative sometimes about wanting to change things because mm -hmm. the Michael Brentson, you had a question. Yeah, I, um, just to talk about this piece, let's say compare, and talk about the problems of this piece as, as compared to, let's say, the Burgers in Calais, and just about the content of this piece, because it is it is still a piece at some level about the birth of the, you know, the birth of the world, or about a, a, a kind of origin or a kind of newness, in other words, and freshness. So the it, it would seem to me that in, in terms of the Understanding than late than a later work, and I just wondered sort of why, even when you're considering the surface, sort of why the, the actual meaning of this particular piece didn't seem to enter into the discussion. Or maybe I'm just misinterpreting the work, but but somehow the idea of newness and freshness and beginnings uh, seem to be built into the surface notion here in a way that <coughs> didn't fit necessarily with other pieces, and then maybe that would, to some degree, also. Uh, shape the way you would, you would think of the, of the patina all the time. Yes, I'm, I think that's, that's very interesting. I suppose what I'm probably coming back to all the time is that, th I mean, this piece was conceived in 1877 and it was conceived um, as some kind of awakening piece as well as being a piece about being vanquished. Um, but now, we're, it's 130 years later, and it's had another history. And I, I find that I think that's p part of its meaning now too. And I suppose I keep coming back to the fact that I was a. Uh, I, I felt. What would we have been trying to achieve if we had given this a complete restoration? And what might we have lost? And what we would have um, we would have given it something I think that was in some ways false. And in other ways, I feel that this is true. This is how it is. And we would be giving it a new surface that was a, a conservator's surface and a conservator's idea of what the original surface should have been like. So in, in a sense, this has a truth to me, although I can see that it's, it's, an, it's a different truth. Um. We need to move on, but well, well, if they could just close down PowerPoint and bring up the last two slides, and we could just take a very brief question while that's just been set up, because these last two slides are, are very um, relevant to... We're okay, though. We've got a quarter an hour. Still. Uh, well, I think Steve wants to break. Do you? We're okay for time. Well, can we just take Nora, would you like to? should be uh, taken from 
further on, however, I can only accept this point of argument if I assume that there is a very uh, close and serious connection between all the owners of costs and all the treatments and point of view of all of them, thinking globally. I think this is an issue which we haven't addressed. Assuming this, and assuming that this part is functioning extremely well, then I'm okay, you have a good argument uh, saying that yes, it is something which happened and would show us what can happen or what might have happened. The bottom line is, 100 years after uh, this piece had been outside, we had no idea if Trotten would have been here, if he would have said okay or no. And Derek is again right in the point that depends on uh, which uh, point we want to make, we could pull uh, quotes from the artist or somebody who knew the artist, pro or contra. So I wouldn't be uh, peaceful in my mind about this sculpture until I clear all of these questions. And I would really address the issue of, do we really communicate enough owning so many uh, copies, which are authentic copies, that we can really afford leaving one this way, one the other way, because we do trust each other uh, colleagues enough that uh, we would have some kind of global benefit I think that moves us on nicely to the next the session. Suggests that this is a, a good topic to come back to at the end of the yeah. session. We will have a long period in the afternoon when we can return to any issues like this that really haven't been satisfactorily uh, yeah. uh, dealt with or finished off. Uh, so hold any of the kind of questions you have. We have to move ahead now, however, and um, as people are getting set up in the gallery, Ruth, I don't know if you're still here or not. Ruth had asked, Ruth Butler had asked, this is a kind of introduction to what was going on with the Rodan discussion that we show these two slides. The slide on the left is the original bronze cast of the Age of Bronze that was put into the Jardin de Luxembourg in Paris, outdoors. Um, interestingly enough, it, as that garden became an outdoor sculpture garden, one of the first important ones really in, in Paris, but uh, you see that he had certain accoutrements which made him <laughs> more uh, uh, palatable for the, for the age. And then the work on the right is uh, a very, very early uh, cast, plaster cast in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia Academy, I believe, was it not? Right? Was it not? Right. Um, which came to this country quite early and is a, a life, known to be a lifetime uh, full-size plaster cast of this particular piece. So that may come up in, in the remarks that are going on in the gallery. So. Ruth, Ruth wanted to note that the piece was shown, seems to be shown low, but looking at the slide here, I'm wondering if actually there's a plinth that isn't in the photograph. You can see the edge of the plinth on the bottom yeah. left. Yeah. 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 Uh, that'll come up again as when we're in the discussions. Well, I think the, the question of multiplicity, I mean, the idea of all these different pla uh, casts in different places around the world and they're different states. It is exactly ties in with the, the title and the, the intention of the conference. Multiple states, variable states. So, um, we'll take about ten minutes break. We'll start in about five to ten minutes. Okay, so um, they're setting up, and there's going to be a break of five to ten minutes, and then we'll start again. Most people will gather back here again, apart from the people who are going to discuss the age of bronze in the gallery.